Good evening. We are here with uh, Martin Reeves, uh, uh, Managing Director, Senior Partner, and Chairman uh, for the Anderson Institute at, uh, at BCG. Thank you so much, Martin, for, for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. As you know, Martin, we are running a number of interviews to explore this concept that we call the Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Enabling Organization taking inspiration from the work that Hire has been doing for many years, the Brendan Hayi model, but also trying to build connections with plenty of other organizations. And we thought that it, it would have been great to have this conversation with you to bring your perspective around how strategy is changing, how innovation is changing, and what we can learn from Hire experience, but also from these other, other pioneers. So let, let's get started. I think that it's clear, research clearly shows how in the last few decades, uh, both technological and social disruptions uh, have appending uh, the, the balance between the outside and the inside of the firm. And on the background, I think we have lots of tensions. You are in the US, <laughs> we are in Europe, but both of us, we have climate, uh, let's say, instabilities, we have political instabilities. And at the end, all of this is impacting businesses and organizations in terms of productivity, in terms of employee engagement, uh, uh, in terms uh, also of the inability or ability to react uh, to market shifts. How are these trends uh, influencing, unfolding into the work that you do with clients and in your own research? Um, well, it's worth checking first of all what the trends are. So I think all business books um, for the last uh, you know, three decades begin with a chapter that says the world is more complicated, faster moving than it's ever been, and therefore here's a new theory. Um, so if you look specifically at um, the fade rate, um, the, the rate at which excess returns or um, competitive advantage decays, it is true that on average that has accelerated massively. And that does have an implication that we need to, therefore, renew strategy. So I was brought upon the mantra of sustainable competitive advantage. And in many cases, now we need to think about serial temporary advantage or renewed advantage, or you might call it dynamic advantage. Um, it's also the case that um, corporate longevity um, is, uh, is, is, is fading and competitive volatility is increasing. I think the, the caveat is that these things are true on average, um, but one of my messages is, is not that we need to, an entirely new uniform approach to strategy, but that we need to de-average according to the circumstance, to the specific business. Because the other thing that's happening, which is less talked about, is that the spread of conditions across businesses is increasing. So we still actually have some relatively stable, planable businesses. Anything to do with demographics is relatively planable. Demographics changes only very slowly. So. Uh, to pick a sort of slightly macabre example, you know, if you're in the business of funeral urns, the little pots you put your grandmother's ashes in, then you've got a fairly planable business. If, on the other hand, you're in uh, video games, um, you know, then you 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 don't. Um, so I think um, the uh, how this affects our research into into strategy is that we need to think more about dynamic forms of strategy. Uh, we need to think about vitality, which is not performance; it's the uh, potential for future uh, performance, the potential for future growth and performance. Um, so forward-looking strategy. Um, I think the key things about dynamic strategy are essentially uh, either uh, real-world needs-driven adaptation um, or ideas-driven, imagination-driven uh, creative uh, strategy. Those are the two themes that get played out relative to uh, traditional strategic planning. And then I think the other sort of big implication is um, that we used to think about strategy and organization as separate, um, but in dynamic strategy, you have to have the right structures and metrics and culture supporting the strategy. So I, you have to think about what I call the entire strategy stack. You have to think about the, uh, the strategies and the, and the leadership and the culture and the structures. You have to think about the whole thing. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's very useful to think about a separate uh, discipline of, of strategy anymore. What you're saying is really interesting. Um, it is my understanding, hearing your words, is that uh, the organization design, the organization model, at the end is part of the strategy and it may affect strategy. And in a sense, this is what uh, 
higher uh, with its uh, micro enterprises, but then also with the mechanisms to coordinate the effort of different micro enterprises, such as EMC, such as industry platform, uh, is doing about strategy. At the end, there is no big unique static strategy. It's a, a very fluid, somewhat distributed idea of strategy. Um, do you consider this to, to go in the direction emerging from your research? Can you think about other examples? Um, yes, I, I think the relationship between organization and strategy is more complex and more subtle nowadays um, for a couple of reasons. So one, we're stretching the dynamism of strategy to an extent that traditional slow moving hierarchical structures can't really cope with that very well. So that's one thing uh, that we need. We, we need structures that facilitate rapid uh, adaptation and, 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 and flexibility. Um, I think a second thing is, um, it's in the essence of adaptations. But, so basically adaptation is profoundly local and also profoundly global because somebody somewhere has to try something and get a result. And that's generally, generally an empirical thing, not an analytic or a deductive finding. So that's profoundly local. But then if those innovations and discoveries are not scaled, then they don't benefit the enterprise. So it also has to be uh, somewhat um, uh, global. Um, so I, I, I don't buy the idea that it's only about decentralization. I think it's about um, top down and, and, and bottom up. Uh, and then uh, the other interesting thing is that causality may be reversed because if I, if I ask a question, which comes first, the, the strategy or the implementation, the conventional answer would be, of course, the strategy comes first. Uh, but actually, an adaptive strategy, that's not necessarily true. The action, the trial, the probe comes first, and then that is later scaled, and that process happens uh, iteratively. Um, so we need, uh, we can't afford a big separation in time between the conception of the strategy and the implementation of the strategy. So for these reasons, we have to think about um, organization strategy, what I call the strategy stack, um, holistically. Uh, how does this impact the role of the leadership? Because, you know, usually strategy is something we do in a small room with big guys, right? Uh, not so much uh, with tens of thousands of people interacting with customers every day. Um, well, I think there are a couple of implications for the leadership of strategy. Um, so in a very stable world, um, we can lead with experience. Essentially, the, the smartest, most experienced person in the room could say, I've been doing this for 20 years, we should go in this direction. And that, that may be a pretty rational way to organize. Um, the thing about um, dynamic strategy, though, is that we, we don't know. The, the truth has to be discovered, and therefore we need a more a decentralized approach to strategy. So the role of leadership becomes more setting the context for the learning process. Um, so you might call it contextual leadership, um, and, and that's a very different type of leadership. It's a leadership of um, embracing diversity, empowering others to discover, uh, making sure that the knowledge processes of the organization are working, etc. So it's more like an empowering form of strategy. The, another aspect is, um, uh, is, is I, I guess, diversity. Um, uh, if we constantly have to change our ideas and approaches to strategy, then we need a diverse population of ideas to start off with. And that probably means that one unique leader with one unique mindset is probably not the way to go. So we need the cognitive diversity in teams. So this word leadership, it's a little bit ambiguous as to whether it means a person or a group of people. I think, I think we're moving towards a situation where we need uh, more group of people. On the other hand, that's offset against the need for agility. So I know of one example, uh, actually the Mars confectionery company, um, that because of the requirements of, uh, of, of dynamism move from a situation where many, many people are involved in strategy to essentially two people drove, drove the strategy. And the, the logic there is the, uh, the agility and the clarity and the focus and the simplicity, because if we have to change our strategy a lot, it needs to be easily communicatable. So it needs to be more like a story that everybody then can relate to than a six volume binder that only a couple of people um, understand. So we, we have many moving parts and probably more actors than in the past. Uh, how to keep coherence? 
what are the basic constructs the firm can use to guarantee that at the end uh, uh, we don't have different pieces going in different uh, directions and then fragmenting the organization, wasting resources and momentum? Yes. So, so I think, um, you know, in popular accounts, we need more experimentation, we need more diversity, we need centralized leadership. And this is true to an extent, but I think maximizing uh, divergence doesn't necessarily get us to the right place. If we have a hundred strategies and uh, a thousand people involved and we change it every day and we never, uh, we never focus, um, you know, I think that's unnecessary complexity cost. Um, so what are the focusing principles? I think it's all about focusing on uh, what remains constant. So we've, we've just focused in our discussion on what changes, more is changing, but what is not changing? So platforms change less frequently uh, than uh, the, 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 the products and the services of those platforms. So we can think about what is the relatively stable uh, platform. Um, we can think about the company's purpose. Um, so the thing about changing your strategy very often is you can't re-optimize for everything all of the time. And we're in a world where the social consequences of strategy, the social and ecological consequences are much more important now. They have to be considered. Um, and so the idea of purpose, the idea of why does the corporation exist? What is the fundamental intersection between a corporation's capabilities and the needs of society? Uh, that can be relatively simple, but if that's a constant, then that I think helps to guide people. I think a third thing we can think about is selection. So um, if you go back to the basics of, of, of evolution, of adaptation, essentially you need three things. You need variation or experimentation. You need selection. Uh, you need to choose the things that work. And then you need to uh, amplify those things um, so that you can extract benefit from them. And if we don't have the selection stage, um, then, uh, then essentially we just multiply uh, complexity. Um, and of course there is some benefit in having a zoo of competing strategies, um, but that's not something to be maximized. That's something to be offset against the inefficiency of keeping around all of your uh, failed experiments. So something like a stage gate mechanism um, or, or a, um, a, 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 some sort of discipline in resource allocation. So the amplifying success is not amplifying everything. I think these are important elements uh, of, of, of coherence. The other one, I guess, is, 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 the, is the protocol for doing things. So in a sense, what is the, the higher philosophy? It's a, it's a protocol. It's an operating model protocol. It's how you structure and how you behave. If there are some constants in, the, see in that, then the, the grist for the machine may change, but the machine itself doesn't, uh, doesn't change so much. So that's a constant that people can hang on to that can bring uh, coherence. Is there a space for beliefs and values in strategy? At the end, uh, uh, what I hear, what CEO Jiang Rimin says is that uh, everything started from uh, thinking that human beings have an untapped potential within the enterprise and that the customers should be more important uh, in guiding what the organization does. And the practices at the end are just an implementation, a pos possible implementation about these principles. So, do you think that uh, at the end, some basic principles should be the big one or anyway, the constants uh, in building strategy? Um, I think principles or simple rules are another way of um, simplifying and giving coherence to a dynamic strategy process. And the ones that you mentioned, I think exist for a good reason. So custom orientation, I mean, it's always uh, perennially been regarded as a good thing by business. And it's also a hard thing because uh, a corporation is like a sphere. The, uh, the, the, the bigger the radius, the, uh, the lower the ratio of the, the volume to the surface area. In other words, more and more internally pointing jobs proportionately, which means less people looking at the customers in the outside world. So it, it's a force of gravity that needs to be defined, if you like. I think in terms of dynamic strategy, it, it has a special significance because if you're not looking at what you're adapting to, you're essentially perpetuating a mental model based upon yesterday's observations as opposed to observing what is changing uh, uh, afresh. Um, so that's, that to me is a, a very significant principle. Um, another one would be to, um, 
to embrace unique human cognitive capabilities. We haven't touched on this, but another thing that's going on while we speak is a, is a technology revolution and routine human cognitive tasks are being replaced by AI and that's set to accelerate and continue. And um, so, you know, what, what do the humans do? It means that a lot of white collar knowledge work is now essentially in the process of commoditizing. Now, the good news is that anything to do with empathy, uh, anything to do uh, with ethics, anything to do with human ends, the enterprises are a creation of humans for human ends, anything to do with human purposing, human ends, and anything to do with imagination, counterfactual thinking, are unique human capabilities. So uh, there's at least one company, um, Google, that has an explicit policy of migrating human cognition to higher levels of uniqueness and value added. And in fact, I'm just working on a book um, uh, which will come out next year called The Imagination Machine, about the role of imagination uh, in strategy, which is not only about creativity, it's about a synergy between uh, machines and, and people. So these sorts of principles, I think, can be uh, uh, very helpful. And most of, the, um, most of the exotic models in strategy are like hires, for example, or Zappos, uh, are associated with a set of interesting principles. And one of the things I've been pondering about is what are the commonalities of that uh, set of principles? Any thoughts about that? Is there common patterns uh, between these, uh, let's say, very mature, a bit extreme organizations, or at the end, um, each one of them well, is different? I, I think it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but there was this famous book that, that are, um, arrayed all of the ethical beliefs, the virtues of the world religions, and created a common denominator. I think a similar thing is possible for, um, for, for, for the, uh, let's say, the new operating systems of business. Many of them um, have principles of decentralization, uh, principles of external orientation, um, uh, principles of the extended firm, you know, leveraging the assets and the capabilities um, outside the firm, uh, principles of human enablement and human freedom, if you like, anti-bureaucratization. Uh, Gary Hamill just has this uh, new book, uh, Humanocracy, um, which essentially is the liberation of human beings from um, from, from structures that were created to manage routine work. So there's an element of that. Different companies call it different things. Um, so this, all of these companies have a, a set of principles. But the, 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 the ultimate foundation, I think, is, is, is dynamism. The idea that there is not a monolithic top-down strategy that's relatively constant across time, which is a very big thing, because uh, if you remember the, um, uh, the, the, the modern father of, 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 of business strategy, Michael Porter, you know, once said that a strategy is not a strategy unless it lasts for at least 10 years. And that was a perfectly reasonable thing to say at the time. It's a perfectly unreasonable thing to say in many circumstances today. It, it seems uh, many aspects, many uh, foundational aspects are, are changing as well in the firm. And still, if we look at other examples of organizations, such as Morningstar, such as W.L. Gore, um, they have been doing, they have been experimenting with these similar practices for decades. Uh, what is that that Ayer is really doing differently from them? Or at the end, it's just a different uh, degree uh, of movement in the same directions. To what extent are we building something new? Um, well, I think there are a lot of commonalities in these alternative business models. Um, and uh, we just spoke about that. Um, um, I think we have a little bit of a Cambrian explosion of uh, pre-Cambrian explosion of life forms in business. So we, you know, it's too early to say which ones will survive and become new orthodoxy. Um, but outside in, um, uh, it seems to me that Hire has a concept or that I'd call an internal ecosystem. And I think that's a very interesting concept. Uh, it essentially says, you take this traditional distinction between uh, the the dynamism and self-organization of the marketplace and the, and the planned economy inside the company. And you turn, that concept up, you turn that concept upside down by actually bringing the marketplace into the company by turning the company into a marketplace. Uh, essentially, the enterprise contains many, many enterprises or many business units. And the, the role of management then becomes to essentially create the common uh, fabric or platform on which they operate and uh, and, and receive resources and, uh, and receive, you know, amplification or diminution. Um, so, so that to me is the, 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 the fundamental essence of the higher model. And I think many things follow from that, you know, the role of leadership, uh, the role of uh, collaborators outside the firm, 
the proximity to the, uh, the customer, the, uh, the, the, the tolerance or the positive embracing of, uh, of, of diverse ways of, uh, of doing things, and also even how you view success. You know, success is not necessarily instantaneously, instantaneous, in it, instantaneous efficiency in the sense that it is, of course, massively inefficient in static terms to have uh, thousands of business units. Um, but if you say that your goal is to survive and adapt in the long term, uh, then it becomes a form of dynamic efficiency. I guess this is what uh, Jiang Ruimin calls the, the, the rainforest, and not looking at the tree, but really looking at the rainforest. Uh, is this something that uh, every organization can do? Or at the end, culturally speaking, this is so distant from large, in, from many large incumbents that uh, even thinking about uh, the same that Ayer did in 40 years at the end is, you know, uh, a bit erratic. Well, many of the um, people you're interviewing for this video series, uh, myself included, I think are um, proponents or champions of this set of ideas we're talking about today. Um, but you know, in the interest of intellectual honesty, we must concede two things. One of them is that in spite of these alternative models being talked about for years, they're still remarkably underpenetrated. Um, I believe it's the case that all of the Fortune 500 companies still organize, technically speaking, as bureaucracies, for example. Um, that's one thing we must admit. And then the second thing um, uh, that we must, we must admit is that most of the examples that we have are either relatively young companies or relatively small companies um, and or digital native companies. Um, so uh, we must ask two questions, I think. One of them is, do we believe it's just a matter of time, that we believe that over time that more companies will or should embrace these new ways of thinking? And, and, and secondly, do we believe it's possible for incumbents to do so? Um, so I do believe that it is um, inevitable that we'll have um, a greater embrace of dynamic strategy and dynamic organization uh, over time. And um, because the, there's no sign that the, the technology revolution, which is driving a lot of the instability and speed and dynamism uh, is uh, plus plenty of steam yet. So, so, so I do think that that's an inevitable trend. Um, I do think that incumbents can embrace these things because we do have some good examples of uh, incumbents self-disrupting. So we have an example of uh, uh, the, the Microsoft Renaissance, we have the example of the Nokia Renaissance. Um, we have uh, Apple Computer, it used to be a computer company, not, not a, a digital ecosystem. Um, and um, one of my clients may be lesser known, uh, uh, an engineering company called uh, Thorn Thornton Tomasetti. It's a leading civil engineering company. Um, you know, essentially they embraced uh, some of the ideas that we're talking about today rather successfully. So it's possible. Um, you know, but I, I think it's all about change management. I think it's, it's very hard for a highly structured corporation with a relatively uniform mindset, with a historic success model, to walk away from that historic success model um, and embrace something which is unproven at scale with risk to the core business. And um, in fact, one of the things that we know about strategy is that in theory, companies could self-disrupt before they're disrupted, but typically they don't self-disrupt until they until they have to, you know, necessity uh, is is the mother of uh, transformation in, uh, in 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 that sense. So therefore, um, you know, I, I'm a strategist by profession, but I keep finding myself coming back to organization and change management as perhaps being pivotal to whether we're able to embrace these new ways of of, of, of uh, thinking and, and doing things or not. Yeah, you, you pick my interest now, uh, and there are two two, two areas. Uh, you, you talked about a couple of magic words. Um, first of all, um, Ayer has been consistently an example of self disruption before having the need to disrupt itself. So we know that at least in some cases it is it is possible. And still, as you said, we see. Most of the market, I don't know if that's 90%, 95%, still stuck into a model that is inspired by scientific management. So what's the difference? Or to put it in a different way, what's the process, the journey to get started? Well, I think one key element is um, 
is, is embracing a crisis as a leader. It could be a real crisis or a partial crisis or an imminent crisis or an artificial crisis. Um, so in the case of Hire, uh, there's this famous story from uh, that the chairman tells about this sort of shoddy, you know, refrigerator factory making refrigerators that had all sorts of defects and, uh, you know, low quality. And, and um, he talks about um, a, a very symbolic event whereby he, he, he has the, the workers smash up the, the, uh, the, the substandard refrigerators uh, with, with sledgehammers. And so what, what, what does he have there? He has, um, he has symbolism, a story, a sort of crisis. If we don't fix the quality, we're gonna die. We need to disrupt ourselves. So that's an example of a leader embracing the crisis of quality and productivity that, that Hire had at its, uh, uh, at its in inception. And um, equally, um, you know, P&G going back a few years um, said, look, you know, we're, we're the ultimate consumer centric company, but maybe we've forgotten about the consumer. Let's renew our focus on the consumer. And uh, luckily they had this, um, this, this renaissance of the business in a, in a very consumer centric um, uh, fashion. And um, I, I play uh, strategy games with, uh, with some of my clients uh, I call them pre-strategy games, where the idea is to uh, create the appropriate sense of both possibility and also threat in order to free up, to fluidize uh, current uh, men men mental models. And one of the games I play is called the Maverick game, where you look on the periphery of the industry of companies that are taking a bet against your business model. And they're often very small, they're often you know, very marginal, but you do an experiment where you say basically, if this alternative bet against our business model were successful, what would the consequences be? And the, the impact of, of playing that game is that it creates a, an artificial crisis. It creates a, a thought experiment whereby you contemplate your own downfall and, and what you want to preemptively do about that. So I think this is probably the biggest trick that, that leaders can play to mobilize their enterprises, uh, create a crisis or uh, mobilize against a crisis. Right now we're in the middle of a, the coronavirus crisis. And I think it's a great opportunity um, that shouldn't be squandered to say, look, we really have to change some things. You know, a lot of companies have discovered that their supply chains and their business models are not as resilient uh, as they wanted. It's taken them months to, to get back to power in terms of performance. So. Uh, you know, a good proportion of, of, of my clients are saying, look, we're, we're going to take this opportunity to improve the uh, resilience of, of, of our enterprise. But there are other um, means too. You know, I think, um, you know, the circulation of elites is another one, which is, you know, bringing new, new blood, new perspectives from outside the industry or from different age cohorts into, into, in, into management. Um, I think there is, uh, um, you know, this hiving off part of the business as a, uh, as a sandbox where you're going to make some new things happen. So rather than try to change everything, you, you know, you change uh, one thing. Um, I think um, uh, sometimes it can be done with alliances. I remember um, a pharmaceutical client of mine once said, you know, the reason we're doing this merger is partly because it makes sense in terms of efficiencies. But the main reason is to give ourselves a, uh, an electric shock, to give ourselves a, a cultural disturbance, which hopefully will be the impetus for, for further change. Uh, so these are the sort of leadership and change management acts which potentially enable an incumbent to uh, to reframe mental models and to uh, unleash uh, change. And yes, this brings us to the second magic word, change management. And uh, we are focusing uh, on uh, adaptive times. Uh, uh, advantage is adaptive and the organization is adaptive or dynamic. Does change management, is it still meaningful? Is it still the right way to think about uh, the transformation of organizations under these conditions? Well, I can't think of anything which is more important and more broken in business than change management. Um, as I sometimes say to clients, you know, there's only, there are only two things wrong with change management. One of them is change and the other one is management. Otherwise we're, we're fine. Um, but uh, change management, Large scale change management we know doesn't work very well. So we, we have a, a set of uh, you know, constructs that are based upon common, ex common sense and experiential assertion. And we know that this is, doesn't work very well, but 75% of major change efforts uh, fail. Um, I've, I, I can prove that with data for 
post-merge integrations. I can prove that for um, reactive transformation programs. And I, I'm just doing some research on the combination of the two. What happens if you're doing a transformation at the same time as a, as a post-merger integration, which will be happening a lot during the COVID crisis. And, um, you know, the odds of success are not very, uh, very good. And, and if you look at it, there are a couple of problems. I mean, one of them is um, that it's not evidence-based. So one of the things that we've been doing is to say, let's, let's actually collect data on um, thousands of transformations and, and look empirically at what works and what doesn't. And you typically find that some things are not surprising, but there are some surprising results. So it turns out that most of the difference between successful and unsuccessful transformations, for example, comes from growth, not, not cost reduction. So if you know that, that, that automatically changes, uh, that automatically changes uh, everything. Um, we, um, uh, we can avail ourselves of some new analytics tools, workplace analytics, to, um, uh, to actually x-ray things that we couldn't, that were invisible before. So we can, we can now ask questions using natural language processing like, how externally oriented is this company? How future oriented is this company? And we can look at all of the verbiage, all of the things that are being said on internal and external communications, and we can make a determination. So it turns out that guess what? External orientation and future orientation are criti critical to success uh, in a transformation. There's a vast difference between, uh, uh, between companies. So we can be, um, you know, be evidence-based. Uh, the other one is this word management change management. Uh, I think there are certain types of change that we can manage. So if you want to reduce operating costs by say 2% or 5%, um, I, I think this is a pretty manageable process. We generally know we have good information on costs. 5% um, doesn't usually sink the ship. The secondary effects can be managed. We can be relatively planned about the process. If on the other hand, we're trying to um, pilot a new business model with, um, uh, with consumers, um, we have uh, something which is more like a complex system. It, the, the word management would not be appropriate to that. Uh, iterative experimentation or adaptive change may be a, a better way of thinking about it. So um, uh, just as we need to diversify our concept, constructs of strategy, we, we need adaptive strategy, planned strategy, visionary strategy, renewal strategy. So we need to diversify our concepts for change. So I think a taxonomy of what sort of change are we talking about and what's the best way of going about it uh, is, uh, is, is, is an important uh, ingredient of success. And then uh, just coming on stream right now are some real-time uh, analytics that we never had before. Um, you know, we go to work every day, we work in the workplace, and we, but actually we know almost nothing about how people move around, how they communicate, what they do, because we, until recently, we couldn't observe it directly. But now using uh, sensor badges and network analytics, we can, uh, and voice tone analytics. We, we can actually figure out what's the organization talking about, what's it actually doing. And it turns out that what it's doing is quite different from what, the, what formally, according to the SOPs, it should be doing. And how it organizes is actually quite different from the mandated formal, the formal structure. But we can measure all of that now and, uh, and say, and then, therefore ask real time questions. Um, just as we've in increased the clock speed of strategy, we can ask real time questions about is this change that we're trying to bring about actually actually working? For example, we can look at, are these two groups that are supposed to be designing something together actually talking to each other? Is the tone of those communications antagonistic or, um, or, 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 or cooperative? Is it still stuck in diagnosis stage or is it uh, moving ahead to recommendations and implementation? We can ask these sorts of, uh, ask these sorts of questions. So I think all of that is what I call the, uh, the science of change. I, th I think that, uh, you know, we need, and it will become increasingly possible to be much more evidence-driven, much more real-time, um, much more um, contingent in our choice of change strategies as we go about uh, change. Otherwise, we'll have great strategies, great structures, but we won't be able to get them done properly. You mentioned complex adaptive uh, systems, and uh, there is lots of theory around it, and. Uh, uh, many scholars uh, suggest that uh, human organizations are human complex adaptive systems. And some of the implications of this concept is that uh, you cannot manage. The outcomes are emergent. At the end, you have many, uh, many actors interacting in simple ways, but generating um, unpredictable uh, results because the initial conditions are so impacting that uh, pragmatically, it's not possible to know what is going to happen. 
but these systems are changing themselves. So at the end, there is no consultant or no manager outside from the system to change the system. It's the system experimenting, uh, they say, uh, far from equilibrium. So at the end, at the edge of chaos. Uh, how does it work when, when organizations look like that? And uh, my understanding is that uh, higher is trying to get inspiration probably from complex adaptive systems. So you have this migrant enterprise interacting with simple rules. Uh, in a sense, is the system changing itself and finding its own way at the strategic level and the operational level? Well, I think the truthful answer is we don't know. So at the level of philosophy, I think there's been a big embrace of complex adaptive systems theory. Um, of course, practitioners don't call it that, they call it something else. Um, but, um, uh, but I think in, in principle, there's, there's no problem with embracing emergence and embracing the true complexity of organizations and feedback loops. Um, the trouble is that we don't have very good interventional philosophers. So the, the worst way to use complex adaptive systems theory is simply to negate management. If you just give me a list of things that I can't manage anymore, if the proposition is you think you're managing X, but actually you're not, then as a manager, what do I do? I say, okay, great, thanks. Give me an alternative. Um, and um, so uh, we, need, we, need, we need a theory of intervention and I, I think we don't have it yet, but, it, but I think we know something about it. So we know that um, a very empirical approach is the way to go. So instead of saying uh, the financial projections say and therefore do X, in other words, in, in, instead of working with financial tautologies, you know, we want to increase profit, so therefore let's increase margins. So let's, therefore let's increase prices, so therefore let's increase the prices of products A, B, C, we're done. Instead of simple linear approaches like that, you actually say, well, how does the pricing variable work? If I, if I flex pricing a little bit, what happens? So you develop empirical scale curves and rules of thumb. And some of them may work as you expect, and some of them may work um, uh, in, in quite almost the, the opposite fashion to what you expect. But the point is you, you, you probe the behaviors of the system. Um, I think the second thing you can do is, um, we know that systems are best shaped at, at high levels. Um, so at its most primitive, I think mechanical management consists of mandating outcomes. Profit is at such and such a level, make it 2% higher by doing these two things. Uh, we know that's a very bad way of managing complex systems because essentially you're trying to lean against um, unknown feedback loops. A much better way is to say, well, what are the feedback loops and which ones do I want to amplify? Which ones do I want to suppress? Or you operate at the very highest level with the, uh, with the metrics and the norms which, 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 which govern the system or the narratives that are in people's heads. Um, so I think ma managers know, know how to do that. Um, now, of course, there's a mental battle to be won to establish the legitimacy of those principles uh, because you know rigorous forensic accounting will always seem more rigorous in a certain sort of way you know part of uh, the complex adaptive systems approach to, to business is being a little bit more tolerant with fuzziness and, and not knowing it all we have to we have to get used to that um, we have to um, develop the the practical tools and procedures that enable us to plot that empirical scale curve um, or to or to shift the norms and the and the and the, uh, and, the, and the and the metrics of a system. I think we're just at the beginning of that process of of actualization of of, of, of translation. I think we have a lot of good theory, but now it's the time for the uh, for, for the for the practitioners to actually do the tra translation. And um, I think Hire is one of the companies that is uh, you know accumulating experience of what works and what doesn't in that respect. And I would like to go back to another uh, concept you mentioned, uh, there is purpose. And uh, I'm really interested in your opinion here because I, I wasn't able to frame my mind. Um, is there, do you see a purpose meant of doing something bigger than just uh, you know, generating uh, results and uh, maximizing uh, shareholder value in what IR is doing? At the end, is there space for um, passion, emotions, and trying to to reduce externalities and trying to regenerate value for society into what companies just hire are doing. What's your feeling about that? 
Um, I, th I think certainly, yes. I mean, what is a company? The, the corporation is a human construct for human ends. And we get to decide collectively what are those ends. And uh, so at one point in time, um, it appeared to be that, um, that that end was the maximization of total shareholder value. And we, uh, we, we sort of mock that point of view a little bit nowadays, but um, you know, it has a perfectly sensible logic behind it that um, we can achieve our other ends um, uh, through, through other means, through, um, through regulation um, uh, and so on. Um, you know, that's now not the, uh, not the modern view. Um, so I've, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, what are the requirements to succeed holistically in business in the next decade? And it starts with what we spoke about at the beginning of this conversation, which is what I call competing on the rate of learning, competing on dynamic advantage. And um, I won't reiterate, but we talked a lot about how to do that. In order to do that, you need to uh, look after the whole strategy stack. You need to uh, organize for learning. And it's everything we spoke about plus the technology angle. So I'm very interested in the blueprint for what I call the hybrid learning organization that has machine learning deployed to its maximal effect. It has humans deployed for their maximal, maximal effect. It has maximum synergy between the two and aggregate dynamic learning. We don't really know how to do that yet. There's a handful of companies that are experimenting with that. Um, Amazon, Alibaba would probably be amongst the leaders, um, but that's another agenda. The third agenda is the science of change that we already spoke about, which is that's going to involve a lot of change. We have to get good at change. Uh, we have to get real time, uh, empirically driven um, and nuanced in our change strategies. Um, the fourth thing is that um, the human resources, if we're relying on the creativity and the cognitive diversity of human resources, uh, we really need people to um, fall in love with their corporations again. We need them to and bring their whole selves to work. Um, we need to embrace different points of view and backgrounds. Um, that's an important thing to do from an ethical perspective, but it's also important from a purely business perspective, because if we don't have a diverse population of ideas, we're gonna have a, 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 a sort of a cognitive monoculture that uh, doesn't help the corporation adapt. And then um, the longest term risk is the shift in social and, and natural systems. Um, which could undermine the game of, uh, of, of, of business uh, if not addressed. And therefore, this, this, con this construct of purpose or maximizing um, social and um, business value, uh, I think is tremendously important. And um, we know a certain amount about how to do that, but that, that's still uh, a work in progress. So we know that measuring you know, ESG metrics and so on, having a, having a purpose statement, um, uh, reporting on your, uh, your carbon footprint and so on. We, we, know, we, know, we know about all of that, but what we don't really know is how to make this balance. It, it comes down to essentially, if you strip it right back to, to, to first principles, essentially the core problem is, is a trade-off in time. Is it, you know, is it jam today or jam tomorrow? So the efficiency school would say jam today, please. And the, um, uh, you know, the sustainability school would say, no, no, let's, let's worry about um, you know, our grandchildren, but in practice, we have a trade-off. And how to make that trade-off is something that I think we need to, uh, we need to get better at. Um, and then, um, you know, as part of that, I think, um, to answer your question directly, yes, that involves human motivation, human diversity, um, human aspiration, human imagination, and human inspiration. Uh, so we, as we think about organizing. We're not just technically organizing to learn. We're organizing for those bigger human principles too. But that's very much part of Hayes' philosophy to uh, empower and unleash the creative abilities and motivations of employees. And I'd say that's a common strand across a lot of these alternative organization philosophers. I would like to close this conversation uh, looking even farther. Um, do you believe uh, that as a society, without thinking only about the organization, but uh, as a society, we are now an inflection point in history in which uh, we should decide uh, as individuals, uh, as families, but also as businesses, what kind of role we want to play. Is this something you see 
happening right now or is this something that we will realize in 20 years, in 30 years? Are we at the point in which the business is really ready uh, and determined to do its part in, uh, let's say, saving the planet? Because at the end, it's the only one we have, at least for now. Um, I do, actually. I do think we're at an inflection point. Um, and it's probably to do with the, the footprint, of, footprint and influence of business. So there have always been side effects to corporate capitalism. Um, always the... Um, throughout the history of business, we've had um, issues like transparency and, uh, and, 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 and fairness and um, e e equality and uh, pollution. These are not new issues, but I think they've reached a, an important critical point where now we do have the ability to prejudice our own, our, our own, our own futures. And I'm living in California, so I, I can literally look out of the window and see the, uh, see the orange sky and the smoke um, and see people moving out and, um, uh, and, 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 and see the, uh, the incredible tensions and mistrusts um, that result from all of that. And, and it's, it's quite real. This sort of somewhat theoretical long-term issue has become a very short-term and a very uh, visible issue. Um, so I think um, the, now is a good time to, to, to address these things. And we, we have an opportunity. And I think it's an opportunity for business. And if, they, if business fails to uh, avail itself of that opportunity, um, what will happen is that the larger systems in which it's embedded, uh, the, the natural, the political uh, systems, the social systems will, will mobilize against business. We'll start to have issues with, um, with trust, trust in technology, regulation, restriction of um, freedoms to operate that we take for granted in business. So it's very much in business's interest, both as uh, stewards of resources and of the planet, uh, but also in their own narrow pecuniary self-interest uh, to, to, to address these issues. Thank you, thank you so much. And just to uh, close it uh, again, this conversation is part uh, of our own exploration of this concept of the EEEO. And we're going to run a masterclass about some of these topics and about the random he he uh, next month. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for your thoughts, your perspectives, uh, and, and your considerations about this uh, important junction that we have both at the business and the societal level. Uh, please let's stay in touch. And again, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks very much.